only new arrival I have this week is one that I missed, um, which it's not it's not actually a new title, but somehow I missed it. It's uh, the Power of Myth by Crazy Dog Audio Theater. Mm-hmm. And uh, man, I, I love these guys a lot. So um, if if you're not familiar with Crazy Dog Audio Theater, I urge you to go to crazydogaudiotheater.com. And theater is spelled with an R E, not an E R. The proper <coughs> way. The, the, proper the proper way, way. right? And um, they've got a lot of great stuff on here now. Roger Gregg is the guy in charge of that, and he's got some uh, really good stuff for people that make audio drama. Um, he's got uh, a nine-minute sketch that you can download called "Writing for Audio Theater," and he's also got. Um, an essay called Writing for Audio, The Basics, and uh, it's an introductory essay, and it's, it's all well worth it. And they've got a lot of samples on there. In fact, I was looking at their, uh, their free downloads, and one of the free downloads is the first one I ever heard from them. It's called The Zombies of Dr. Krell, and uh, it is hilarious. Lots of fun. That's free? Yep. Um, we should I, should have put, I should have put that on my free stuff. List. Oh, you still can, you know. That thing's not <clears> over. You bet. There you go. Because, uh, yeah, that I, I, I still listen to that thing. It's uh, Big Big Space was a six episode. I believe it was six episodes. It was kind of a farce on Star Trek and I Voyager still haven't heard that one. All that, and it's it's well worth it. It's it's it, it'll make you laugh. I expect it to be awesome. I actually just posted about um, uh, Silver Tongue Devil on my last uh, five feet five yeah, I saw that. favorites. I saw that, you bet. So the Stuff of Myth won the, one of the awards, the, the Mark Timer, the Ogle Award, mm-hmm. for the best fantasy uh, audio drama of the year, last year, so in the 07. Right. <clears throat> I heard one of them, I can't remember which one exactly, on, uh, I think it was Sonic Society, it could have been um, on Radio Drama Revival, one of those podcasts mm-hmm. had it. Great. Great. Well, I've got it, and I'll be listening to it. I can't wait. I'm excited. I also noticed one, too, um, that they have. It's called Crazy Dog Live, but I, I don't know if that's an older one or... Uh, I, I can't find it on the, their titles. So hmm. I'm going to have to find out if that's old or not. But anyway, regardless, I'll give that a listen, too, because I, I really enjoy their stuff. This is uh, audio theater excellence. Yeah, Roger Gregg surely, surely knows what he's doing. It's... Amazing. Mm-hmm. So, how about you? Got anything arriving over there? Uh, the only thing that showed up uh, that I, I think we haven't talked about is uh, "Whipping Star" by uh, by Frank, Frank Herbert. Herbert. Yeah. This is the one I haven't read uh, by uh, Herbert in paperback or hardcover before, um, mm-hmm. and it's never been on audio before. Um, don't know much. From Tantor. Yep, t- from Tantor. Um, mm-hmm. They've got a bunch of new Frank Herbert, uh, new to audio Frank Herbert, non Dune stuff, which makes me happy um, because you know what? Uh, as I I've been writing about uh, writing about it for a recent arrival, I guess I was saying you know they've wrung Dune dry. <laughs> it's <laughs> like you know let's I don't know let's make another fourteen books in the Dune series just because uh, it's so awesome. Well. Mm-hmm. Uh, after a certain point, you know, you start running out of ideas, and uh, I think I ran out of ideas after book one because uh, I didn't think Dune Messiah that was that great. So, mm-hmm. I have not read anything past Dune. Uh, Don't. Well, I, I did. No, no, I did. I did review one. Well, two, two of the Dune books, the two of the Dune audiobooks. Um, one of them was not memorable, but the the other one. Was called uh, the Road to Dune, ah, and I okay. thought that was yeah. I thought that was really really worthwhile. Yeah, that that, that was not basically an exception, though I think. Yeah, <clears throat> that was basically a book about Dune or, or about the the writing of Dune and the I Dune heard universe it too. Yeah, and after you, stuff like you that. Just do it. I heard, heard it, and I think uh, you're right. That is a good exception. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I I listened to the original books. Um, I think books on tape released them years and years ago. Um, up to, uh, I think, the, the original six books in the series or five books in the series by Frank Herbert before um, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson started uh, writing writing up a storm. 
And um, I, I gave up after the second book. Um, uh, my friend Steen kept going. He he went into like the fourth or fifth book, and, and he he still for years later he's still complaining about how crappy they are. Oh, yeah, uh, just like yeah, because I I, I understand that. Um, I mean, it was originally envisioned as a trilogy, and it wasn't like he just added Messiah and Children of Dune, but. Uh, they were conceived of together. Dune, Dune, Messiah, and Children of Dune were really one book in his mind. I don't believe that. I that's believe that, that was in Road to Dune. I, I know that, but I don't believe it. I I believe that that's what authors say to themselves after big money starts rolling in for the first book. Mm -hmm. Um, back then trilogies really were uncommon. The only real trilogy that had happened was Lord of the Rings. I mean, this these books were written a long time ago, um, uh -huh. and you know, modern modern trilogies and modern quadrilogies and subtopologies or whatever they are <laughs> are all uh, sort of the children of Dune in a way. <laughs> hmm. That was not a uh, planned pun, but it's actually literally true. I, I think that, you know, we, we didn't see uh, science fiction novels that went on and on and on in a series until Dune happened. Hmm. So Dune sort of shot science fiction in the head uh, <laughs> by uh, being too successful. You're saying that uh, series are evil? Um, not universally, but generally, yes. Generally. <laughs> I think it would just gotcha. sort of defeat the purpose of science fiction. Um, I was talking to uh, Tony Scott yesterday uh, from Starship Sofa, and he was saying... Uh, he was saying uh, he listens to the podcast while he's walking his dogs, and well, I don't know how we got on the topic, but uh, our parting words were like something like, uh, "Yes, and all all people who don't like science fiction are zombies." <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I think the exception would be that people who only read series are zombies too, because um, really it sort of defeats the purpose of science fiction. Um, is to present ideas in a new way and uh, always be always be changing your your opinion of what science fiction could be and what uh, what the boundaries of it are. I guess. Hmm. Um, well, by that definition, uh, you know, ninety percent of what's out there is not good science fiction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think okay. I think that that's <laughs> probably true, but you know, we don't see that in audiobooks because. You have to remember that um, no matter how many science fiction books get published, um, only a small fraction of them still are getting audiobooked. Yeah, but the, the, the ones that are getting audiobooked are generally the most popular ones. Generally, yeah. Generally, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there, there are still big, giant gaps, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, um, I don't know, fight, you know, start publishing a wish list or something like that. But like the book of the new sun by Gene Wolfe, you know, um, I'd love to see that on audio. And, and another thing, you know, I, I enjoy lists <laughs> and I saw a They're list. Very popular. Uh, you and you and SF signal. That's right. That's right. Um, I saw a list, uh, science fiction authors were asked to, uh, put together a list of the most important books of the last decade or something like that. And um, very few of those that were on there. The number one book on there, which is the one I I just received it in the mail just the other day because I ordered it. Mm -hmm. It's the River of Gods by Ian McDonald. And um, so anyway, I'm going to give that a read. Mm -hmm. But you know, you're not seeing stuff like that on audio. Well, you know, so I the, think the ground I think though the you have to remember that stuff, sometimes that it's it's um it's it's not it's not because that that's not uh, audio worthy. It's that it's uh, that particular contract didn't have audio in it, and that if if it's if it is worthy, it is coming to audio. It's just it's going to take some time. Right? Generally, what happens is um, if you've got an audio contract, you get audio books. If you don't have an audio contract, like like for example, uh, anything written by Lawrence Block gets audio booked by Harper Collins. Now, oh, you're saying everything he's written is on audio? You know what? Almost everything. Isn't That's that amazing? Astounding. It's wonderful. That is really amazing. It's yeah. wonderful. Um, Donald Westlake is almost that way, but he keeps—he's got too many publishers, um, which is 
kind of, you know, Stephen King is, is another story. You know, basically anything he writes now gets turned into an audiobook. Now, right. his older mm. back catalog, maybe not uh, quite it's, yet. It's but, almost all there. It's almost all there. Yeah. At some point it was released. And um, mm -hmm. I think that, especially when you're a new person, I mean, think think of the way uh, John Scalzi's first book, uh, first, you know, big book, got uh, published. You know, uh, Old Man's War didn't get uh, an immediate release upon its publication. It took some some doing because he, the publisher he went with, didn't have an audio program. Yeah, but I think that that's a function of the popularity of the book. The it is a function of the popularity of the book, uh, but the popularity of the book is a function of which publisher you get to get into bed with. You know, it's you know. Think of it like this: the studios of um, the movie studios. Uh, if you're going with Paramount, Universal, or uh, you know 20th Century Fox, you're going to have a giant release, even if it's a small movie. You're going to be mm -hmm. in the theater for a while. Um, it it doesn't have to do with how good the movie is, although there is a relationship with you know big studios liking to get good movies. Mm -hmm. But the release is not uh, commensurate with how good the film is. The release is commensurate with how big the studio is, and it, it works the same with books. If if the publisher you're you're going with doesn't have a audiobook line, you're not going to have an audio come out when your your audiobook comes out, hmm. right? So um, one of the ones I'm really into right now is the uh, the um, hard case crime paperback line, um, and it's very cool. Um, and they've got a lot of titles that I'd love to see on audio, but they don't have a, a big contract with somebody. They have sort of a sporadic contract with uh, B B BBC Audiobooks to release a few things, um, like all the Westlake titles and all the uh, Morris Block titles. And they do. They release every one that comes out, even if it's already been to audio. And... They also release, uh, you know, a few others like Ed McBain, who's another big, big name. But they they pick and choose. They don't just release every audiobook that comes out. Whereas, um, if it's a Harper Collins audiobook, ninety five percent chance that it's going to be audiobooked. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I do. So just because, um, just because it, it's uh, a a really good title, really good book doesn't mean it's coming out. So one one of the ones I wanted to see come out was uh, L The Lies of Locke Lamora. Uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but I I, I was in the uh, bookstore a couple of times, and I heard some some of the staff members recommending this book to people. Right? That's a good mm -hmm. sign that it's a good book. It also sounds really interesting. It's, it's a fantasy uh, set in the world of con men, and I think that that's really... Uh, an interesting idea. I also I heard an interview maybe on Dragon Page about it, and it sounded really interesting. I, it sounded it sounds like a good book. It's got positive reviews. How come it's not available on a, audio? Because the publisher doesn't have a an audio division. So the only way it's going to get audio booked is by some publisher like um, Macmillan making a separate deal. Yeah, and then that deal's not going to be made unless it's a popular book. But uh, again, you know, uh, it doesn't. It's not. It's not necessarily that it, it's it's a popular book. It's also necessary that it's a popular book within the audio market. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Yep. So. You bet. Hey, uh, you mentioned not, hard case crime. Thing. Yeah. Um, I uh, just noticed I got my the latest issue of Locus this week, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Roger Zelazny has a hard case crime book coming out. He sure does, and I'm hoping, hoping, it's hoping. The, it's not yeah, science it's, fiction. No, it's called The Dead Man's Brother. Got a great cover, too. Does it? Love cool. Hard, I don't, they don't have a cover art in there. But. Hard case crime is so awesome. Uh, I, I, they get brand new art from all the classic guys. Uh, um, the most um, famous is Robert McGinnis. He draws these, um, he paints these... Almost every hard case crime has a picture of a, a woman holding a gun or something like that. Um, very pulpy, old-fashioned <clears throat> covers. Um, and uh, he does he does the very distinctive 
um, you can you sort of tell who who did the art and um, Robert McGinnis does some amazing work. Glenn Orbick does a lot of the covers too. He's amazing as well. I'm I'm like thrilled to bits with basically every every uh, one of those hard case books. Yeah, and I've read two of them that you sent me once. I, not on audio. They were, audios weren't uh, there. Yeah, they that. didn't have audio right away. Yeah, but they were they were they were good. It was Grifter's Game. Yep. I think that's, that's one of the ones one. you gave a. Yeah, you gave a, a essential to that one, I believe. Yep. And uh, I read Stephen King's one. Yep, that which was, was okay. Yeah, it, it was a little they, unsatisfying because the the ending wasn't there. <laughs> I think it it's like, supposed it to be a mystery. Out. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, and it seems to me that I read one more too, but I can't remember. He did a huge one. favor for for Hard Case Crime by p- releasing that. Um, they mm-hmm. got so much publicity based on the fact that they had a Stephen King book. Um, that was their number thirteen in the series, and it's very thin novel. It's it's um, not the, that one. There, the audiobook release on that one uh, was not by um, BBC Audiobooks. It was by Random House, who probably had a, a deal with Stephen King, so... Yeah, probably right. That's that's an exception. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, they're, they're amazing, amazing books. It's one of the reasons I wanted to expand into Aural Noir, is just to have the chance to talk about these books. Great, great. I just got one, oh. um... Uh, I bought the paperback version because um, uh, it's not available on audio, but I heard uh, on... Um, a podcast that I really like called um, uh, "Behind the Mask," behind the Black Mask Mystery Writers Revealed. It's um, you know probably the most amazing interview uh, show you'll ever hear because they do so much research. The the two guys who who do the podcast are like uh, super academics. They're university professors or ex university professors of literature. So. They they give like this amazing interview, just going deep, deep, deep into the into the writing style of the book and the influences. They're really big fans of film noir and and uh, and mystery and crime, so they know what they're talking about. And they talk to the author of um, one of the f- books in the series um, called uh, the book's called Money Shot, and it's. Uh, by Christina Faust or Krista Faust, who's um, she's the first woman to get published by Hard Case Crime, and I just started reading the paperback, but very very um, solid sounding novel so far, and great. Yeah, I'd love to see that as an audiobook, but uh, you know she's she's not. A, I think this is if it, if she's got other books, it's you know she's not on the famous list, so no mm-hmm. audiobook for her yet. The cover of Locus this month is Neil Stevenson, mm. and we were talking about uh, Anathem last week. Um, turns out I was wrong. Um, Anathem, the book came out this week, uh, but the audiobook is not scheduled to come out until o- October 14th. Okay. So. That's a month away. Bummer. Oh, well. So. I decided to wait for it. I'm not going to get the print version. <laughs> so I, I d- did. I convince you, or where? Uh... You you did. I was okay. like, well, yeah, I'm going to want to listen to it anyway. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah. if if you're going to listen to it and and paperback it, you're going to have a mm-hmm. hell of. Well, I did that. I did that with Snow Crash. He's got he's got a style that you know. He, it's a unique style of writing. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people know, seem. To I think... wanted to see it. I wanted to see it in print. Well, you still can. Get yep, it from the library, can. although, <laughs> how big is your library? Not big enough. Not big enough Not for big nine. Enough. I, live, I live in a small, <laughs> small town, so it's like, you know, uh, yeah, their, their audiobook section is well stocked. Yeah, from you. Right. <laughs> so if you're, if you're into science fiction audio, you want to move to this town. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yep. People must go in there and say, what the heck? What are they yeah, doing? they do. <laughs> The librarian scratches her head. She's like, "I don't, I don't buy this stuff normally, but people keep checking it out." So really, yep. Oh, that's yep. great to hear. It is great to hear. Yeah, every now and then I go in there and I I pick one up and see if it's been checked out and stuff. And 
Yeah, they're getting circulated. So. You know what? I'd like. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'd like to see the old-fashioned, uh, um, you know, the book. Uh, book inside the book's cover, there's a little card with people's names on it. Oh yeah, that would yeah. be cool. Just so you can you can go into the library, and sneak over into the audiobook section. You open the front flap and you look at the names and you say, "Okay, these are all people." You, you see repeated names. These are all people I could ha- go have a conversation with, rather than <laughs> that's right. You know, that's right. And it's like a secret society that way. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing like a book to uh, converse over. Well, it, it really is a secret society. Most people are busy, is, busy yeah. watching the Olympics and. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. Talking about that all day. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> iTunes 8.0 was released this week. Sure was. Um, what do you think about that, Jesse? Uh, well, Scott. <laughs> well, it's always, it's always good to remind people who they're t- listening to. Yes, um, I uh, I found out about it through Audiobooks.com. They did a, had a post on their blog um, saying that it was uh, it had a new unique feature for audiobooks, and that made me interested. Uh, mm-hmm. I read the post. Did you download it yet? I read the post and I downloaded it because of that. And uh, mm-hmm. it's true, it does have a unique uh, new feature that is very good. It allows you to take um, uh, MP3s that you've uh, made by ripping your your uh, your audiobook that you've got at home. Um, so, for example, I got, um, as I was saying, Whipping Star came in the mail uh, from you. Thanks very much. Um, mm-hmm. And I put, put all six discs into the machine, ripped them to uh, MP3. Um, and then I'm going to go put them on my iPod. What do I need to do? So I made a playlist, dragged, uh, dragged and dropped the, the files into it. Um, and then you go, uh, you select the files and right click on them. You go to get info. And under one of the tabs, you can now change the category so that it will end up in the audiobook section of your iPod. And that is very good because that means that um, it has all the bookmarking features, which um, you could find workarounds for in um, older iTunes, but it still didn't end up in the audiobook section of your podcast, uh, of your iPod. Yeah, that's right. Um, Yeah, Yeah, I used it yesterday and I found the same thing. It's great. It's really great. You know, another thing that I do with iTunes that I found recently that people may have been doing the you know the entire time, but except for me, what's that? Um, they use really small tracks on their CDs, um, so that it's easier for people using CD players that uh, are not audiobook ready to find their place when they stop. Right. So anyway, so when you rip it into iTunes, you may have you know thirty tracks off a CD. Right. And uh, I found, you know, I was ripping those in that way, you know, so I'd have, you know, an audiobook could have, you know, 140 tracks or whatever. Right. But iTunes lets you join those CD tracks when you rip it in mm-hmm. so that you have uh, one track for a CD, basically. And uh, anyway, that was a new discovery for me, but ah, it lets you do that. I didn't know that. I don't usually use yep. iTunes to do the ripping. I, oh. I, I don't find it works. It's the, basically, it's still designed for music. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I think Evo was mentioning how um, on the on the post he did about how the music ends up, uh, you know, defaults into music. Well, I have one song on my iPod. I have one <laughs> song among 570 files in my iTunes, and that doesn't it doesn't work for me. So um, I'll uh-huh. tell you though I, I, about iTunes eight. Uh, even though it has this new feature, I was um, tr- I was looking to da- re-download an older version um, shortly after installing it um, mm-hmm. because I didn't realize it had some of the same functionality as um, as it had uh, in the older version. So what I mean by that, there's a um, when it you reinstall or when you install iTunes eight. Um, it defaults the podcasts to um, this uh, view with um, a grid 
instead of a list of yeah, your podcasts, yeah. and they show up as images with a little bubble beside it showing how many files are new in each podcast. And I was like, this is horrible. I can't. See, I I can see it's like it's designed like a giant menu of uh, uh, things I could click on and listen to, but I can't look at the details of and manually drag and drop and delete and all that stuff. So I was I was horrified and I was I was pissed off and um anyways I I was just you know I was just about to delete this and reinstall or do a rollback or something to get back iTunes 7.7 and uh then I discovered at the top there's a little tiny button that says view um that uh -huh. allows you to change between cover flow um, this grid and uh, a, the regular old-fashioned list, which is what right. I wanted. So, um, <laughs> long story yeah. short, I ended up not uh, uninstalling. Right. But I'm so. Anyway, all glad. the all the audio books on my player were done that way, and they all show up in the. There's only one audio books thing now, and yeah, works great. Works fantastic. It works very nice. Um, mm -hmm. I I can't say how it would work on. Uh, for other people, but um, I'm very pleased to say that it works well for me. Mm -hmm. iTunes 8 is is not bad. It does have, you know, it, I, uh, sometimes I blame it on the Apple being a different sort of functionality than uh, than the evil Windows. But mm -hmm. um, I think that it's just, you know, you can't please everybody. And by trying to make it simple, um, you can make it hard for people who are used to uh, doing it their own way as they've done for years and years. And so yeah. what they've done here is they've they made it relatively simple um, by having lots of different options, but the default are too simple. So uh, because it went to this grid mode immediately, I thought, oh my god, they've dumbed it down to to you know work with the people who are obsessed with showing off their iPhones or something, uh, just uh -huh, little buttons sure. for every for every uh, podcast is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for deep functionality. Right, right. And we don't advertise the fact that uh, we're both using iTunes for for uh, our playing of most of our uh, podcasts and and such. Mm -hmm. But that's the truth is that's what we're using. Yeah, that's true. So um, you also mentioned a piece of software called MP3 to iPod Audiobook or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, just... It's actually a piece of software that I've used too. It's MP3 uh... to iPod Audiobook Converter. Yeah, sort of unwieldy um, title, but it tells you exactly what it does. MP3 yeah. to Audiobook iPod Converter. Um, it's available at www.freeipodsoftware.com. And this is an older piece of software. Um, it's version 0 0.18, released February 2008. But I, I've got an even earlier version. This is a great little piece of uh, software that's designed to make your life easier if you're an audiobook fan. Um, it's open source, um, very simple interface. What you do, you take your MP3s uh, that you've got from your CDs, you rip from your CDs, you drag and drop them into the... Uh, thing or you hit add and navigate your way to the folder where they are um, and then you can select any details you want to change about uh, making them all the same author or all the same uh, title um, down the bottom and then you hit convert it takes maybe five minutes ten minutes depending on how long your audiobook is I think it took 20 minutes for my uh, my conversion of um, whipping star and um, then you've got an M4A or M4B file that is already uh, ready for your iPod. It doesn't work with other software as far as uh, as I know. It's only good for iPods and uh, iTunes. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know what? Probably doesn't even work on uh, Mac, but works great on a PC. You bet. And I, I downloaded it for the express purpose of being able to join yeah, um, MP3s joins. together. Yeah, yeah, and that that's why I downloaded it. But um, I'm I'm happy enough with the feature in iTunes where you get one file per disc, 
um, you know, when you join the CD tracks on as you rip it in, like I said, uh-huh. that I don't I don't go anything past that. I don't make one giant file out of an audiobook because one one of the things that I think is a flaw in an iPod is um, if you go to an audiobook and you play it um, and you fall asleep, your audio your your iPod's going to play for your bookmark the yeah. entire time you're asleep. Yeah. Okay, what's a what's a bookmark? This may be something that I'm not aware of. Um, no, you're right. Um, uh, but this is bookmarkable. So, um, oh. it's, mm-hmm. if you're walking down the street and you 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 say, you know what, I'm tired of this audiobook. I want to listen to something else for a while. You know, change over to music, God forbid, or um, you know, mm-hmm. another audiobook or a podcast. You're when you navigate out and and uh, go listen to something else. When you come back, it you're left off at the same part part where you were. You, you've bookmarked it. Oh, okay. So that's a bookmark. Okay. That's a bookmark. That that's a feature that's always been there then. Because yes, if but you... only for audiobooks. Okay, but if you if you point at any file and right click and pick get info. Right. There's a there's a setting called remember playback position. Yes, absolutely. That you can turn on for each file. Absolutely, but um, it still ended up as a uh, in the playlists. So um, the, this um, addition of you know iTunes 8, this new feature is it basically it's an incremental change to recognize the fact that this is what people have been doing mm-hmm. the hard way, right. but it ends up as music shows up in music on your iPod, and that's not actually what it is. Yeah. Uh, makes mm-hmm. makes it more difficult for people to understand what the problem is, um, and this is sort of uh, to you know rectify matters but i agree sure. it 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 was possible however it was more difficult than you know like i didn't know that for you know right away there's no walk through for audiobook people if you if you read the you know you read the how to do your how to run itunes or you read uh watch a video on how itunes works they don't mention audiobooks audiobooks they they might mention that it's you can download audiobooks Right, and they've got thousands of audiobooks, but it doesn't show you how to navigate and control. So that get info, um, right click, and then uh, mark. You know, after navigating through a couple of check boxes and menus and stuff, it's there, but it wasn't very clear. True. Yep. So. Yep, I agree. These are the little tricks um, that they've they put in there. Well, that's great, but making them a little more explicit helps, and mm-hmm. uh, that's what's happened. So it's an incremental right. change, but it's it's very uh, useful in the end. Let's talk about this terrible movie I watched. Oh, okay. I watched this terrible movie. <laughs> what was it? It's called Sunshine. Um, Sunshine. Yeah, I think it came out 2007. I uh, just mm-hmm. watched it on DVD, rented it, and watched it. Um, and um, I believe it's by the guy who did 28 Days Later, um, and the, the guy who wrote 28 Days Later, too, which I liked. Uh, I thought the ending of that was not that great. But um, anyway, Sunshine, mm-hmm. I watched it last night, and, and um, it's kind of why I don't like science fiction movies anymore. Isn't that sad? That is sad. But, you know, I can't argue with you. You know, there's, uh, you know, science fiction movies have not been good for a long time. Not good science fiction, let me put it that way. Why, Scott? Why? Why? Because they're not smart. I don't think that they've been smart. So what was the last good science fiction movie you saw? Um, that that's in, in order of release, you know, not in order of release. I would have watch to say, 2001 again. I would have to say probably Minority Report. Really? Okay, I wouldn't even say that's a good movie. I would say that's mm-hmm. an okay movie at best. Yeah. Um, did you see I, I thought it was uh, I thought it was good science fiction. Yeah, I did see iRobot, and I I liked it for yeah. what it was. You know, it's... I did. I liked it. I thought that uh, you know, there's some Asimov in there, and they yeah. didn't dumb that one down. No, not too much. I think they did an okay job. Uh, what about the um, the more recent version of uh, I Am Legend with Will Smith? Another Will Smith movie. Did you see that? Oh, I thought it was. I thought it was fine. I, you know, yeah, was I wasn't enamored with it in any okay. way. It wasn't anything like the book. I mean, 
the book was way better. Was, you know, no, it was something times. like the book. It wasn't yeah, radically but, different. Well, I, yeah. it, it's set in New York instead of Los Angeles. Uh, um, there's a dog in it, but not the same way. And mm -hmm. and the ending's different, obviously. Right, that, right. That's where I had my. Problem. But other than that, it was the same. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me tell you about Sunshine. Okay. Okay. This is mm -hmm. um, this is a. Uh, I just I. Sometimes you'll see me in public. I I had someone point this out the, the other day when when I'm listening to some public speech or um, I'm interacting in a non -inter, uh, with a non interactive medium. So watching watching somebody uh, give a speech or um, uh, listening to something on the radio or something something that's uh, non-interactive where I'm not participating in the conversation. I'll be shaking my head back and forth. <laughs> like <laughs> I was shaking my head back and forth. This whole movie, I, I'm, I'm probably going to have neck pain for a week because of this movie. Um, it's terrible. Um, the premise is um, there's something wrong with the sun. Uh, mm -hmm. it, the sun's dying. So they have to send a human expedition to restart the sun, uh, jumpstart the sun. Uh, how are they going to do this? Well, they're going to send a spaceship full of 30-somethings, all very young and attractive, um, into uh, uh, orbit of the sun, um, get really, really close to it, and then launch a bomb into the sun, which I think would actually uh, cause the sun to um, just use more energy, uh, more do more converting of uh, hydrogen into helium. Um, I don't see how a bomb's going to help the sun very much. But... Um, Beside that, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Beside that, the first half of the movie is terrible, and yet I've read online people's reviews saying, "Oh, the first half of the movie is pretty good." No, they're wrong. The second half of the movie uh, doesn't follow from the first half. That's true, but it follows in the sense that the second half is just as bad as the first half. <laughs> um, the, so they have that in common. <laughs> oh, it's it's horrible. It ends up being Freddy Krueger in space. Um, the there's no sense whatsoever. It's not a science fiction movie. It's a horror movie uh, set in a science fiction uh, setting that is terrible. So one of the things, uh, you know, I can forgive in some shows if it's not really about uh, science fiction, I guess. Um, like Battlestar Galactica has fake gravity. So does Star Trek, right? Their ships mm -hmm. have... I don't know, gravity plates in the floor that allow people to walk around. Hmm. Okay, I'll accept that. That's, you know, sort of a standard thing because uh, it's hard to do 2001 over and over again, 2010 right. over, and over again. I'll yeah. accept that. Um, well, that's fine, but you don't make a ship with rotating sections then and then have the majority of the ship um, with, it, it looks like the space station, right? Why do you have rotating sections on your spaceship unless it's to generate artificial gravity right yep. no good reason um, the uh, the many of the scenes are just direct ripoffs of aliens or um, alien or such um, I'm not gonna give it a lot of spoilers but there's no aliens in the movie so the um, the thrills come from human-based reasons, and the human-based reasons are terrible. They're just um, sort of a band of illogic, illogical, um, he's crazy sort of metaphors. So one of the things that these 30-somethings do while sitting around in their spaceship um, is go out and look at the sun. They go into a special room that uh, filters most of the sunlight out, and they just stare at the sun. And this is supposed to be, you know, showing some deep relationship that people have with the sun or something. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> they stare at the sun for hours. Okay. <laughs> I understand the idea that staring at the sun's bad for you. Um, I think we were told as little kids, don't stare at the sun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's because it's, it hurts your eyes. It doesn't make you crazy. Um, I think that this whole film is just horribly written, horribly, uh, the dialogue is so stilted, um, but just that it clothes itself in all sorts of science fiction. There's, there is 
there isn't all that much techno babble, which is pretty amazing given how much um, techno technology um, they are supposed to be employing. Um, but I swear to God, there's like eight people on this spaceship. And I said, there's no reason to have eight people on this spaceship if only one of them knows how to do the job at the end. Right? Mm -hmm. The only reason to have all these people is so that they can get killed off slowly as we approach the, the, uh, the end. Um, the other thing that this is something that's bothered me for a while is naming your characters. Um, I was telling you about how um, in... Uh, I'm not letting you talk very much. Sorry about that. No, no, um, it's fine. Uh, I was telling you about how in uh, uh, one of the releases of um, uh, Patio Book, there was a author gave the name of a king in his fantasy novel. He, he named his king Augustus. Right, right. This is a big problem. You don't name mm -hmm. a king Augustus. Because there's a famous guy named Augustus, who you might have heard of. He's the first emperor of Ro the Roman <laughs> Empire. This is like naming, you know, your new president of the United States, uh, uh, Nixon. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and what do they do in this movie? Everybody's got um, some sort of either, uh, either completely made up name or, you know, that's ridiculous, or they just... Uh, steal names from all sorts of different places. So one of the guy's name is Mace. Well, hmm. that's a great name for a guy. I, I think it's possible that some people are named Mace, but I don't think it's possible with uh, a bunch of other people. Uh, one of them's uh, named Pinbacker. Okay. Never heard of him. But um, Pinhead would probably be a more appropriate name for him because basically that's his role in the movie. <laughs> um, and I'm not saying dumb guy. I'm talking about the guy from that uh, horror movie, okay. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a uh, the main character is named uh, Kappa, uh, um, and that's an interesting name. It's not Kappa, the Greek letter, uh, rather it's uh, Kappa C A P A, and his first name is Robert. Well, Robert Kappa is a very famous uh, film photographer, uh, I believe, from the Spanish Civil War, World War II. Um, so just steal a name, right? Hmm. steal yeah. a name, put it in there. Another uh, guy on board is named Searle. Hmm. Hmm. Steal a name from a philosopher, right? Um, just just terrible. This is just terrible, <laughs> terrible movie. Terrible dialogue. And I'm thinking like 28 weeks later is, or 28 days later is uh, is characterized by its ending as being just like this movie. So, mm -hmm. whatever you do, uh, watch Sunshine and die. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> no watching Sunshine. Check. <laughs> oh, no, you should watch it just to see how terrible science fiction has <laughs> become in the movie theaters. I was, yes. uh, I was saying, you know, I was thinking back at what, what the last. I mean, we talked about uh, I Robot. I think that's not even a science fiction movie. I think that's just a uh, Hollywood movie, and it's it's mm -hmm. good for what it is. I'm talking a science fiction movie. This is not a movie that establishes a chain of, uh, you know, sequels. Just a movie that establishes some science in the science fiction universe. A yeah. universe that's real. Uh, showing us something interesting. This movie doesn't do that. Um, oh, by the way, the, uh, the, um, there's a, uh, a commentary track on the DVD uh, mm -hmm. with a uh, University of uh, Manchester uh, f uh, physicist who... Um, talks about the film all the way through. And what's he talk about? He talks about all the... the he was hired right at the end, like right when they're casting the film. Uh, not mm. at the script stage, right? And so what are they, what are they doing? They, they asked him, he said, um, we, have a, you know, we have this script and we want you to look at it and see, see what you can tell us. So why, why would the sun... Is there any way that the sun might stop working, you know? And... And he's saying, you know, wow, we had a really hard time trying to come up with a reason why the sun would be dying in 50 years. Because although the sun loses 60 billion pounds of mass every day, um, the sun is so large. It, of course, like, thank you very much. So you just said there's no reason. And then uh, what do they do? Every time there's a, some plot point that, you know, could be based on real science. What do they do? They completely go the other way, and this guy says, well, you know, we'll just chalk that up to uh, creative license. Right? It's like, this guy was hired to 
give the film some credibility or something. I don't know. Um, all all his contributions are is to say, "Yep, there. This is a this is a creative license, you know." And he's talking about it like, um, you know, just as if it's a good movie, but when in fact it's just terrible. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So it's not a good movie. No, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible, horrible, horrible. And uh, what, what's the IMDb rating? This is why you can't trust IMDb. 7.3 out of 10. Oh, wow. With nice. 50,000 people voting. <laughs> 50,000 people cow. thought this was a good movie. Uh, uh, this is how I felt at the end of the movie. I hope the earth explodes. And all these people who are watching this movie uh, and giving it a high rating die because this is not a movie in which uh humans should live this is not a universe in which humans should live when when this is the kind of movie they think is good this is horrible 